Good morning and welcome to Kalos Church Online. My name is Pastor Amrita. And I'm Pastor Pradeep and you're here live at the Jiva Residence. Yes, we are right here in our kitchen. We're so thankful that you're home today, like many in our community, other businesses, organizations, and churches. We are, we have chosen not to meet in our physical location in downtown Bellevue at the Hilton Garden Inn like we normally do because of coronavirus. We want to make sure that we are taking all the precautionary measures to keep everyone as safe as possible. So the biggest question we've been getting is how long are we going to meet online? And we just want you to know we're not quite sure how long, but we will update you every single week about where we are meeting and try to make it as easy as possible for you. Yeah. So this is a a new experience for all of us. We've talked with pastors all over the nation and none of them have really experienced a quarantine. So we're kind of pioneers to the rest of the nation and what's happening here. So thank you for your prayers and your wisdom and your insight into the situation. Yeah. The great thing is, is that church isn't a building, but it's a people and we can have church together. We hope that you have church together with your family this morning, even in the comfort of your home. And we're really excited that you're tuning in Mm -hmm. with us today. We want to welcome you. If you've never been to Kalos Church, if you've never been in a church, if you're asking questions about God, we want you to know that this is a safe place. Our community is a place that we love and that we hope that you feel so welcome to, even if we're online. And Kalos actually is a word that is Greek and it means beautiful. We Mm -hmm. believe that Jesus is so beautiful and that the mandate on our church is to make known the beauty of Jesus. And so whatever questions you're asking, we want you to know it's okay. And we would love to be a part of your community and you be a part of our community as well. And we want to connect with you. So if you've never connected with us before, you're looking for a home church, maybe you just need some Christian friends and community around you. You can actually just comment right here on this video. Let us know. We'd love to engage with you. And so we're excited uh, to spend some time together here in just a few minutes. Pastor Pradeepin is going to continue our series, Death to Selfie. It's a powerful series. We're really excited about that. And he's going to preach a word here in just a moment. But I want to let you know, too, that we encourage you to have church this morning. Sometimes in our homes, we turn on worship music and we do our dishes. We take care of our kids. But we want to encourage you to be the pastor of your own home. Be the worship leader of your home. Bring your family together. Bring your roommates together. Maybe you sit around a computer or around a TV and you click on the link. And you can worship actually with the same worship songs that we sing at Kalos Church every week. You can listen to the message. And listen, we have not forgotten about the kiddos. So if you've got kids at home, you can actually click uh, on the various links and see the lesson for today. You can get your Bible memory verse and everything. So we want to make sure that you spend some intentional time today having church together. We really believe that it can be powerful for your family. And also this week, we have not canceled our small groups. We're just taking them online, just like we are with our church. And so there are many ways to stay involved and plugged in as we continue to share community here online. So without further ado, I want to go ahead and turn it over to Pradeepan to continue our series. Well, thank you, Pastor Amrita, for the kind welcome and to every one of you that's watching online, which is 100% of you. Thank you for tuning in. And so we're continuing our series, Death to Selfie. And I want to be honest, we picked the title of the series before coronavirus was sweeping over our land. And it's kind of crazy, the subject and how it's lining up with kind of the temperature of our nation. But as normal, I want to start off with a small joke. You ready, honey? Yes. Yes. All right. Well, I am currently suffering from laziness. And so I'm going to try to sleep it off for the next couple of days. <laughs> Usually, if we're doing a live service, this is when everybody erupts in laughter. <laughs> but it's just uh, just us. So <laughs> just listen to myself. Well, let's jump into First Peter chapter four. And we're going to get into the second message of our series. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that is taking place among you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you are sharing Christ's sufferings, so that you also may be glad and shout for joy when his glory is revealed. If you are reviled, 
for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory, which is the spirit of God, is resting on you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, a criminal, or even as a mischief maker. Yet if any of you suffers as a Christian, do not consider it a disgrace, but glorify God because you bear this name. The title of the message today is, Why Do Christians Suffer? Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you so much for this unique circumstance. And as we dive into this message, as we uh, meet digitally, Lord, I pray that we wouldn't forget the people who are who are suffering right now, who are going through illnesses and panic and anxiety, government leaders and health organizations that are doing their best to make good decisions and bring peace in the midst of turmoil. And Lord, I pray that as we dive into this message, I pray that we wouldn't just be hearers of your word, but doers. We pray in the name of Jesus and everybody, online said amen amen so why do christians suffer is the title of my message you know i i've suffered a lot in various ways for for my faith and for things where bad mistakes or just weird consequences i experienced i i remember uh playing basketball and wrestling growing up uh, i remember every time i started a new sport for the season and honestly this still happens to me whenever i'm starting fresh like i haven't played tennis for a couple of months or i haven't played football for a couple of months when i get on that basketball court and i go up for my first layup or try to jump for my first block i always get a muscle cramp i don't know it's because my body's naturally low in potassium, maybe it's because I'm dehydrated, but I just, I cramp up and it's become a, a joke to a lot of my friends that, oh no, here comes Pradeep and he's gonna cramp and uh, oh my goodness, he's gonna whine, he's gonna say it feels like he's giving birth through his calves. And uh, I don't know, it's just so painful. I hate it, you just feel the muscle tense up and throb. There have been times where I've been literally dragged off of a basketball court and it's during those times of suffering, I'm like, Lord, why do I have pain in my calf? Lord, why are my muscles aching and screaming? Lord, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. Oh God, I love you. I've kept your commandments. God, why do I have a cramp? I tithe. Jesus, I tithe. Why am I cramping? And it's these times of suffering where I have a crisis of theology. How can I suffer when I've been following Jesus Christ? Am I not supposed to have a hedge of protection around me? Am I not supposed to have guardian angels all around me? Where is the mercy that the Bible promises I should have? And I, I feel like I'm not alone in these tensions. You know, often in life, when we follow Jesus, we, we hear the preacher say like, give your life to Jesus and all your problems will go away. Give your life to Jesus and your, your pain, your suffering, the tension, the lack of peace, the lack of hope will go away. And I totally believe in the gospel and I believe that Jesus offers life and life abundantly and hope and peace and all those things, even peace that surpasses understanding. But there's this tension I found in extremes in theology where people say when you follow Jesus, you'll experience no suffering. Mm. There's this whole tension over here. And also there's a tension that when you follow Jesus, you will only experience suffering. And I, I don't know if you've ever felt that way. Jesus, when I started following you, it feels like everything started to go wrong in my life. It seems like my marriage was challenged. It feels like my work life and career were challenged. I try to follow you, Jesus, then I feel like a horrible parent. I feel like there's stress. Like, shouldn't this be easy? Lord, why am I suffering? And so I don't know, what tension do you fall into? Maybe you can discuss this as a group after the service, but do you suffer from thinking that we shouldn't experience any suffering as Christians or we should only experience suffering? We're supposed to deny ourselves. We're supposed to pick up our cross. So what's going on in the tension? Well, like much of our faith as healthy Christians, we don't try to find the perfect solution. We try to figure out how do we manage this tension? How do we live in this tension? And so I want to give a biblical understanding and a scriptural basis for why Christians suffer. And uh, it's going to be intense news for those of us who grew up and thought, you know what, if you just have enough faith, you won't suffer anymore. If you just faith it till you make it, you won't suffer anymore. Actually, the scriptures talk a lot about Christian suffering. And so the first thing I want to share is number one, suffering is part of the Christian experience. 
And for many of us, that might be shocking. In many of the circles I grew up in faith, that would be a controversial statement. Like I said earlier, you just have to have faith. You just have to think good thoughts. You have to be positive. You have to almost pretend like bad things don't exist. And then you will experience the fullness of God. Well, I got kind of bad news for you and good news for you. The good news is you're not a bad Christian if you're experiencing suffering. It's not because you don't have enough faith. It's not because you're not reading the Bible enough. It's not because you're not tithing necessarily like all those things. It's part of the Christian experience. And that's kind of the bad news. If you follow Jesus, according to the Bible, according to the words of Jesus, you're going to suffer. If you don't believe me, if you think I'm taking things out of context, well, why don't we go to the context and read some scriptures? John 15 says this, these are the words of Jesus. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I've chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. Oh, that sounds intense. John 16 says, I've told you these things so that you won't abandon your faith. Jesus, what did you tell us? For you will be expelled from the synagogues. Guilty, been there. And the time is coming when those who kill you will think they are doing a holy service for God. This, because, this is because they have never known the Father or me. Yes, I'm telling you these things now so that when they will happen, you will remember my warning. So Jesus is saying, hey, I'm warning you, suffering is happening. The reason I'm telling you this now is so you wouldn't be surprised when it's actually happening. Wow, that's intense. Luke chapter six says, blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you, revival you and defi defame you on account of the son of man. Uh, rejoice in that day. Rejoice in the time when they revile you, rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven. Man, someone just spit in my face and called me a jerk because I followed Jesus. Woohoo! I'm leaping. When was the last time you leaped for joy, Amrita? Um, <laughs> due to suffering? Just in general. Oh, just in general. Um, probably when my kids were being super cute. Nice. I can't do this in a live service, just have a side combo. <laughs> true. Well, here it is. Here we are. So rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven. For that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. In verse 24, he says, But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. And this one really strikes me. Verse 26, these are words of Jesus. If you don't like it, don't blame me, blame Jesus. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. Woe when everyone speaks well of you. I mean, and that's a question I want to revisit a little bit later. Does everybody speak well of you in your family, in your workplace? Whoa. First Peter 4.12 says, Beloved, do not be surprised, like we read earlier, at the fiery ordeal that is taking place among you to test you, as though something strange were happening. This is not strange. Suffering is normal. This Christianity that we have that says suffering is not part of our experience is the new abnormal. It's not normal. Uh, but rejoice insofar as you are sharing Christ's suffering. And then he, he says, you're going to suffer. Don't suffer for all these bad things, but suffer as a Christian. Second Corinthians, we're going to this. One, chapter one, for the more we suffer for Christ, the more God will shower us with his comfort through Christ. Even when we are weighed down in troubles, it is for your comfort and salvation. For when we ourselves are comforted, we will certainly comfort you. Then you can patiently endure the same things we suffer. We are confident that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in the comfort God gives us. I've got so many more scriptures. If you don't think suffering is in the context of a Christian, First John 3, for we know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need, but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. Wow. Philippians 1, don't be intimidated in any way by your enemies. This will be a sign to them that they're going to be destroyed, but that you are going to be saved even by God himself. For you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. It's called a privilege. We are in this struggle together. You have seen my struggle in the past, and you know that I'm still in the midst of it. Hashtag struggles. As a Christian, 
follower of Jesus, if Paul the Apostle had struggles, so can we. Amen. And uh, last one, last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 2. Don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. The devil will throw some of you into prison to test you. You will suffer for 10 days. But if you remain faithful, even when facing death, I will give you the crown of life. Mm -hmm. And so suffering is all over the scripture. We see our heroes in the faith in the Old Testament suffer. We see heroes in the New Testament suffer. In our prime example, the, the author of our faith, Jesus Christ, he willingly suffered on the cross for our sake. And we love following the example of Jesus. And so I want to bring this quote by Oswald Chambers to bring a little bit perspective. And it says this, no healthy Christian ever chooses suffering. He chooses God's will as Jesus did, whether it means suffering or not. And so if you're under the impression that following Jesus is going to make things easier, I got kind of that bad news for you. Jesus says, in this world, you will have tribulations, struggles. Jesus says, follow me and they will hate you. The whole world's going to hate you because of me. Jesus says, follow me. And uh, hey, if you become my servant, guess what? You're not greater than me, the master. So if the world persecuted me, guess what? They're going to persecute you. And so if you aren't experiencing persecution and suffering, uh, I mean, that's kind of an intense thing because we got to ask the question, did Jesus lie to us? Is he wrong or are we not truly following Jesus? And I can't be the judge of that. That's the question we got to ask ourselves. And this kind of thought model for me is like this. If Jesus came to the earth today, just like he did 2000 years ago, as fully God, fully man, just walking amongst us in human skin. If Jesus was in our midst today, and he preached and he got on YouTube and Twitter and Facebook and he started sharing and exposing our, our, our injustice and, and the wrongs and the darkness of the world. Do you think Jesus would be persecuted? Mm. Would people have really mean YouTube comments and Facebook arguments with him? Hey, God, that's not how it's supposed to be. Jesus, I think you're a little off here. Mm. Your statement about turning the other cheek or not, you know, like loving your neighbor as yourself and like, woe to you when the whole world speaks well of you, Jesus, that's a little too far, that's a little too extreme, that's a little too wild. I think we would persecute Jesus. And so if we would persecute Jesus preaching the gospel today, I mean, that's where that intense question comes in right now. Why aren't people persecuting us? Mm. Why are people speaking so well of us? Why do we have such easygoing reputations in our workplaces, in our family? I mean, are you... Uh, I don't know, in your workplace, are you afraid to share the gospel because you're afraid you're going to offend people? Mm -hmm. uh, you're trying to make sure they speak well of you. At your family gatherings, you avoid the topic of faith and sharing your love about Jesus because you know it's going to ruffle some feathers. You want them to speak well of you. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are, these are the big questions. And Jesus says, woe to you. Be careful. Like, watch out when the whole world speaks well of you because they didn't speak well of me when I shared truth. They didn't like it that much. That blinding light of truth was really bright in their eyes that were accustomed to darkness. So so be careful, be careful. So it's a tough, sobering word. It's the scripture. Again, if you don't like that, it's not me you don't like. It's the words of Jesus. And so point number two that I want to share today is the world is currently persecuting Christians, just like Jesus said would happen. So while many of us are not facing persecution, guess what? A lot of the world is facing persecution. I was reading some statistics uh, about uh, 11 Christians every day die for Jesus. And not just even for preaching gospel, just for like going to a church, just for attending a Bible study. I, I remember a number of years ago, I was invited to, to preach in the nation of Egypt. And this was a really, really amazing trip. I remember flying there and getting placed in a hotel. People were really honoring me and the group I was with because we were going to preach at a pastor's conference. I was going to preach for the youth. And I, I remember being in this hotel. It was so luxurious. I went down to explore and I went into this gym that was deep, dark in the basement. It was super dark. It was super hot. I wasn't sure if I was in the right area. I opened the door and there is this very, very strong Egyptian man just in underwear. The whole gym is completely empty. He's waiting right by the door. As soon as I walk in, he grabs me by the arm. He says, now we lift him. We get strong now. 
I was like, whoa, nice to meet you. I was jet lagging. I had just arrived into the hotel. I was ready to rest. He had been waiting all day for someone to walk through that door. And uh, that's not the suffering I want to share about. Uh, this sermon is a little intense. And I remember walking out of that hotel and uh, getting in a bus, going to this pastor's conference. And as we're in this bus, the driver said, hey, we need all of you American Christians to hide below your seats because there are people on the streets looking for you, looking for Christians, and they, they want to kill you. Mm. And I just remember, oh, my goodness, this is like this is real. Mm -hmm. And so we hid there for like a half an hour or something like that and waited until we had the all clear. And then we went to the pastor's conference and they had asked me to preach to the youth about evangelism, sharing our faith, sharing our gospel. How do we, how do we preach on the streets? How do we preach to people in our school? How can we lead our family members to know Jesus like we know? And so I remember talking with some of the youth just to get a feel for this. And I, I asked them, so what, what's going on in your youth ministry? What's been happening and they said well actually we're, we're grieving right now because we had a normal bible study and this 14 year old girl she really wanted to come just study the scriptures with us and she knew it was a risk for her life and uh some religiously zealous people from a different faith uh they actually grabbed her and killed her just for going to a bible study mm. and this 14 year old girl ended up dying because of her faith in jesus wow. and this is the, the context where they want me to share how do you preach the gospel to your neighbor, to your friends. And I'm mm. thinking, my goodness, what? I don't know what to share with you. Like, I, I don't really want you to preach the gospel necessarily. I like, I do want you to preach the gospel, but like a 14 year old girl just died. Like, I don't want to carry that on my shoulders that I'm giving you these tips to like go out, knock on doors, talk to people in your school, share the gospel when you're you're putting your your life in danger for the sake of Jesus. And they they said, no, we we want to share the gospel. This is what we're called to. Jesus has given his life for us and now we want to give our lives for him. And th this is real. Persecution is all over the world. You know, uh, you know, I was, I was reading some quotes by the British Foreign Secretary, and he said that the overwhelming majority, 80 percent of persecuted religious believers are Christians. So 80 percent of the persecution in this world is people persecuting Christians. And then he goes on to say the level and nature of persecution is arguably coming close to meeting the international definition of genocide. Mm -hmm according to that adopted by the UN. And so, I mean, there is persecution all over. I heard the stat that says there's been more persecution in the last century than the 19th centuries before that in all of Christianity. So more people have given their life for Jesus, like, or faced persecution in the last hundred years than the 1900 years before that. That is crazy. Right now they're saying there's about 70,000 uh, Christians in a labor camp in North Korea. I mean, uh, Turkey, for example, used to be 99% Christian. Or, I mean, sorry, it used to be 50% Christian, and now it's 1% Christian. 99% is of a different faith. Christians have been driven out. Syria has lost like 50% Christian. And I mean, it's just in Iraq, 80% uh, of the Christians have, have decreased. It's just happening all over the world. And if you want to link to some of those stats, I can send that to you. But this is a reality we need to recognize that people all over the world are willing to suffer for Jesus. Yeah. Like if we, if I said to that Bible study, hey, in Egypt, if you follow Jesus, you'll never face any problems. You'll never face suffering. They'll, they would say, are we bad Christians? Are we not praying right? Mm. Are we not reading the Bible? Because we are facing persecution. Mm. We're facing danger every single day. Does that mean we're doing something wrong? And I would say, no, that's what Jesus said. Jesus said, follow me and you will be persecuted. A servant's not greater than the master. Follow me and people will speak poorly of you. Mm. That's what it means to follow Jesus. And I, I think honestly in our consumeristic easy Christianity, we have a hard time accepting that. And that's one of the reasons why we wanted to have a series called Death to Selfie, because I believe, we really believe that we are called to not follow ourselves, but follow God. Yeah. And, you know, not pick ourselves up, but pick up the cross and depend on the resources of Jesus, even unto death, because we trust him. And there's people dying for their faith all over the world. And I, I think we just need to be aware of that because we are one church. We are one body. 
Even right now, a church sent Kalos Church $5,000 uh, just because they knew we we're going through all this coronavirus. They had been following along with the news. They knew that we were having to make decisions and they said, hey, you can use this money however you want. We just want to let you know you're not alone. Mm. And it's because they have a revelation of this scripture in 1 Corinthians 12 that says this, if one member suffers, all suffer together. Mm. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And so we are uh, the body of Christ. When Christians in Egypt suffer, we suffer. And when Christians in Seattle suffer, a, a church in Colorado, they believe they suffer. And it's really important that we understand that we're not just an American religion. We're part of a global right. church. God of the nations, mm -hmm. not just God of America. And I think there's a lot we can learn from the global church, mm -hmm. especially those being persecuted. I think a lot of times we think our Christianity is Western and American, and we, we almost try to ex export, you know, our belief systems to the rest of the world. But I, I think that we believe in, in two-way honor and two-way learning. It's not just about us sending missionaries to the other parts of the world, but Every nation has a unique glory to God, and we can learn from the global persecuted church. I learned so much from those Egyptians who said, hey, continue to teach us about evangelism. Even if it costs us our life, even if we have to suffer, we will do for Jesus what he did for us. We will lay down our lives for the gospel. And that is a sobering message, and I want to bring some hope with point number three. I love this line that says, the blood of the martyrs. Martyrs is another word for witness. Martyrs is often known as people who die for their faith. The blood of the martyrs water the seeds of the church. And we've seen this time and time again where people lay down their lives for the gospel to preach about Jesus. The church has had the fruit of the spirit, long suffering, has endured and eventually sprouts up. We see in the early church, Rome persecuted the Christians, the government executed Jesus, and yet the tree of the gospel was able to grow and flourish. Unless the seed dies, it will not grow and flourish. But when that seed dies, it grows, it flourishes, it produces great fruit, and we see this all over the world. As people lay down their life for the gospel, the gospel is move forward. And so I want to bring some hope for us as we talk about this heavy moment and this heavy theology of suffering. I just want to say we don't suffer in vain. Yeah. We know we're advancing the kingdom of God and we don't have to live in despair in a hopelessness state. We don't have an attitude as Christians. Oh, look at what the world is coming to. There's persecution. There's death. Uh, people are turning their backs on God. We don't say, oh, look at the world is coming to. We say as Christians, as believers, look at what has come to the world. And his name is Jesus Christ the hope of the world, the light of the world, the life to all of humanity, the bread, the living water, the, the lamb who is slain before the foundations of the world. He came and he brings us hope and freedom and we will conquer. And there's this mindset that I think we have to have even in the midst of suffering that the church isn't just a garden to be tended. Oh, I need the church to cater to me. I need to focus on myself. Help me blossom. Help me grow help me be watered. Church needs to feed me and, and really satisfy me in every single way. There is an aspect of that where pastors, they bring us to green pastures. They bring us to still waters. Yes, we need to have that. But a church isn't just about being a garden that's tended. We are the army of God and we are a force to be deployed that says, hey, even if I suffer, I will take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Even if I face persecution, I will share my faith with my work, with my family. I don't have to be mean. I don't have to be a jerk. I don't have to be pushy. But even at the expense of my reputation, I will share the love of Jesus. I will make known the beauty of Jesus. So I don't need to just be coddled and catered to. I don't just need milk. I will go forth as the army of God. So we as a church, we are not just a garden to be tended. We are a force to be deployed. Amen. We don't believe the church just exists for us, but we are the church. 
and we exist for the world. Amen. We will take down the gates of hell. Yeah. The, the gates of hell will never prevail against the church. Amen. And so I, I want to read this quote from a Syrian pastor, and it really stirs me. He says this, we're not passing through. This is talking about a persecuted pastor where people are literally being beheaded right now for their faith. He says this, we are not passing through anything our Lord did not pass through himself and triumph over. Being persecuted recently in Syria is nothing. We have been persecuted for centuries and it does not hurt the church, but serves it. Mm. I love that, but Mm. serves it. The blood of the martyrs water the seeds of the church. And we're going to get into that a little bit more next week. And we're going to talk about loving our enemies and what happens when we forgive those who hurt us. Mm. And it's going to be so powerful. And this is happening all over the world. And I, I want to share one last story in a video format before we close this message and end with prayer. And I believe this message about an Indian suffering for his faith is really going to move us. So why don't we watch that video right now? There's a true story of a small village in India. And in this village, there was this family that came to a saving faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. This agitated the village so much and everybody became so upset that an angry mob gathered and shoved them into the public square. The village chief confronted them and he said to the man, if you and your family will not recant your faith, you all will surely die. The man didn't know what to say or what to do. And so the only thing that came to mind for him were the words of a song that he himself had composed when he had first surrendered his life to God. And so he began to sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. And with that, horrifically, his children were killed. I have decided to follow Jesus I have decided to follow Jesus I have decided to follow Jesus no turning back no turning back He was given another chance, this time with his wife's life on the line. And yet he continued to sing, Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back. No turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. After her tragic death, he was given one final opportunity, this time to save himself. And yet he continued to sing. Even though that man and his family died on that day, something remarkable happened. A seed was planted in the heart of that village chief, a seed that began to grow over time, and eventually he called 
the community together in that very same neighborhood, in that very same square. And he renounced his former faith and declared his allegiance to Jesus Christ. And a celebration broke out in that moment and the gospel began to flourish and to grow in that community, not just in that village, but across the whole region because they had seen real faith and they knew the true character of God because of a family that believed and sacrificed even under the penalty of death. Amen. What a powerful video to see someone stand for their faith and how the gospel took root, how the, the blood of the martyrs really watered the seeds of the church. And, and through our sacrifice, great things happen, just like Jesus who laid down his life. And now we are all reaping the fruit of it. I'm so thankful that Jesus suffered for our sake that he laid down his life for our sake. And now I want to just speak to you with gentleness and, and soberness, but are you willing to lay down your life for Jesus in the same way he laid down his life for you? It's so important that we surrender and trust God, knowing that we don't fear people who can hurt our body. We revere the one who preserves our soul. We don't live in fear, we revere God. And we know that we can trust him, we can endure, that our hope is an eternity, ultimately. If you kill me, if I die, I know that the power of resurrection is on the other side. And so we don't live as hopeless people, even when the world around us is crumbling. You know, even the disease that's coming through our land right now, this coronavirus, we don't live in fear. We have a peace that surpasses the understanding of the world because we know that there is power in Jesus in this life and in the next one. We know that we have resurrection power in Jesus. And so though we suffer, it is temporary. And suffering is hard. It's painful. It's difficult. I hate it. There are so many areas in my personal life right now, in our family life, where we are really suffering. We go through pain just like anybody else. But we realize, like, in order for us to experience resurrection, we all experience death first. And we ultimately trust in Jesus. And so we don't have to live in fear with suffering, but we also understand that according to the words of Jesus, suffering is part of our Christian inheritance. Suffering is part of our Christian DNA. And if you're suffering right now, I'm so sorry. I know it's hard, but I don't want you to think as you follow Jesus, if you're facing troubles, a lot of the suffering isn't just because of your decisions. Sometimes as followers of Jesus, you have a big target on your back. Sometimes as followers of Jesus, there's opposition when you're trying to do good. And so if you've recently tried to follow Jesus or try to make a stand for your faith and it, it feels difficult and hard and you're maybe insecure and you're wondering, am I doing something wrong? Hey, maybe you're just experiencing what Jesus said you would experience. Maybe you're not a bad Christian. Maybe it's not because you're, you're just not praying enough or reading the Bible enough. Maybe you're facing opposition because you are following Jesus and not because you aren't following Jesus. And so I want to, to pray for you and I want to challenge all of you. Will you suffer for Jesus? And I, I think that's the decision we need to just make every single day. Lord, I will die daily. Lord, I will pick up my cross suffering and I will follow you, Jesus, to the ends of the earth. I will share my faith and my love and my hope. I will go into every nation. I'll go into Judea, Samaria for your glory, Lord. And those of us who suffer with Christ will glory in Christ. And we find great hope in that. Why don't we pray? Dear Father, thank you so much for the revelation of your word. And Lord, I pray that just like you warned us in the scripture for suffering, that we shouldn't consider it strange, that it's a part of following you, picking up our cross. And for those of us who are just facing suffering moments right now, Lord, I pray that you bring that peace that surpasses understanding. I pray that you bring comfort. I pray that you would bring hope that this will not be the end of us. Lord, that our hope is ultimately in you, not our circumstances, 
not our situations, not our own strength. Our hope is in you. And Lord, you never change. And so, Lord, we pray for all who are suffering. And I pray that you would bring your comfort. And Lord, I also lift up all of us who maybe are are timid in our faith. We're avoiding confrontation. We're avoiding sharing our faith or living out our faith out loud because we're afraid of people not speaking well of us. We're afraid of facing that persecution. Lord, I pray that you give us a boldness and a revelation that following you includes suffering. And we will do it for you, even at the expense of ourselves and our reputation. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, you know, before we transition to an incredible testimony, um, I just want to pray for anybody who's listening to this and, and maybe you're not living for Jesus. And maybe there is fear and anxiety and panic. Maybe you're suffering and you haven't handed that over to Jesus. I love the scripture that says, hey, you can cast your cares on God and he will care for you. You don't have to carry your burden alone. And if you would like to receive Jesus into your heart in life, if you'd like to surrender your life to him and say, hey, I'm not going to lead and live by my own strength, but I'm going to depend on the strength of God. I'd love to lead you in a prayer right now. And I'm going to put those words on the screen. And so if you want to receive Jesus, why don't we pray this all at the same time? Lord Jesus, I need, I need you. you. Everybody, thank, thank you for, for dying, dying on, on the cross for me. I open the door of my life and receive you as my Savior and Lord. Thank you for forgiving my sins. Take control of my life. I turn from my old ways and invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Hey, especially if you prayed that for the first time or maybe as a recommitment, hey, make sure you leave a comment or send us a message so that we can follow up with you. Amen. Amen. Well, that was a powerful, powerful message. I hope that it really resonated and touched you so much. You know, I wanted to share that actually last Sunday um, was another one of these really kind of weighty messages and uh, dying to ourself and understanding that we're gaining uh, when we die to ourselves in the kingdom of God. Yeah. And I was so amazed last week because 11 people in two services last week raised their hands yes. and surrendered their lives to Jesus. And it's amazing because people are saying, you know what, even if it means that I will suffer, even if it means I have to die to myself, I want to know the Jesus who gave his life for me. I want to get out of the darkness that I've been in. I am just struggling. I want to surrender my life to Jesus. So I just want you to know that this is such a powerful yeah. conversation. Uh, that we hope that you continue to have. And uh, we believe that um, Jesus loves you so, so, so yes. much. And so we're excited about all that he's doing in our community. I want to go ahead and transition here in just a minute. We're actually going to hear a really powerful testimony of someone who really, truly did die to himself. His name is Zach Snyder. He has a really powerful <laughs> message and a testimony for us uh, here in just a minute. But I want to encourage you to give as well here at Kalos Church. And there are many different ways that you can give. You can actually click on the link um, and give today <clears throat> um, here at Kalos Church. And I want you to know that that giving goes directly into the life change that you're about to hear. And also the life change that I just shared about with those 11 people who surrendered their lives to Jesus last Sunday. Uh, so go ahead and give this morning. Thank you for worshiping God with your giving. And let's go ahead and listen to this amazing testimony from Zach Snyder. I grew up in Michigan was born and raised in Michigan, went to the University of Michigan, studied mechanical engineering, loved cars, loved cars since I first saw them. I mean, most people think cars are cool when they're kids, but that didn't really go away at all as I got older. And I watched in high school and middle school, all of Top Gear and my friend and I would just work on cars and bicycles for fun. And we were totally obsessed and graduate college and I get a job in the Corvette program at General Motors. So I was in this group of calibrators that sat at a facility called the Milford Proving Ground. And the Proving Ground is four square miles of test track, race tracks, and all sorts of crazy areas where you could drive cars really quickly to test them. And that was my job. I had three Corvette keys at my desk and I drove around test tracks all day and it was amazing. And I did that for a little over a year. 
And then Becca and I felt like the Lord was telling us to to move to Seattle, Washington and start a church with Pretty Bitter Mitha and some other people. And I just had a long process of, of thinking about that and considering that and asking myself, like, what's really more important? The, like, what we feel like God's telling us to do or what we feel like on paper and in every way that is, like, tangible and logical um, keeping this job and, like, have, doing the happily ever after thing. I mean, you could buy a house in Michigan for, like, less than $200,000, so life is going to be pretty chill there. It, like, we had, we knew how it was going to look, and, yeah, the whole thing got disrupted, but the verse that I, that really stuck in my head through that season, um, that I felt like the Lord kept bringing back, bringing me back to it, telling me was, uh, seek first the kingdom of God, and all the rest of these will be added to you. So it's kind of a fancy way of saying, prioritize me first, prioritize my kingdom first, and I'll take care of the rest. Um, let me let me use any part of your life that I want to use for my kingdom. Surrender it all to me, and then I will bless you, and I will take care of you. And when we first moved here, my job was not as cool as GM. It actually was not fun at all. I did not like it. I was there for four months, and in that four months, I could basically focus all my energy on Kayla's church. It was a really easy job. So as the church was being planted, I had so much time and energy for Kayla's. And then right as Kayla's kind of hit its stride and started to settle a little bit after like four months, um, I got the coolest job offer ever, and it's the same job I have now. I'm learning so much more about so many other industries. Like, it's a, it's a... And I mean, nothing will ever be like driving sports cars around race tracks, but it is a seriously, seriously cool job. And I regret nothing. This is, in hindsight, it, this was the way better deal. We love Seattle. My whole family's here. But in that moment, none of it really made sense. And I just had to trust God and let him use my career for his kingdom. And I would just encourage you to do the same because all the rest of these things will be added unto you. And I, it's Matthew 20 something something don't even know exactly which one it is but you can look it up awesome wow amazing testimony amazing. zach thank you so much for sharing that i am always so moved when i when i hear your story so thank you again for sharing that and thank you to those of you who gave this morning i want to remind you to jump into a small group this week online we're going to be meeting all of our small groups are meeting and then again we will update you about what's happening next week with our services so before we go let me just bless you and we hope that you have a wonderful week. So may you know and make known the beauty of Jesus. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you, and give you peace. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Woohoo. God bless. <laughs>